what have you learned so far? First, it's all about the context. Okay? It's the perception of people that defines what we can sell and what we can't. Okay? And uh, so we have to be very aware of what the perception of people are if we're going to try to be proactive at introducing fire safety into um, our everyday activities. Okay? Now, the second one is that um, when it comes to human behavior, there's an enormous amount of uncertainty. We need to understand human behavior to have the capacity to engineer out human behavior. Is that okay? Uh, the numbers that we're putting in in the calculations are not numbers that should be trusted as being calculations, but should be effectively references that we're using to try to understand if we're doing well or not. Okay? We have to try to keep people within the bounds of good behavior in such a way that the approximations that we're making and the analysis that we're making is valid. The moment people enter in a situation of panic and so forth, then all the calculations, all the analysis you've made doesn't mean anything. Okay? And finally, you know, we have learned that actually we need to really understand combustion to get rid of combustion. Okay? That's the purpose. If we're going to try to model combustion appropriately when it comes to fire and follow the path that, for example, people will do in car engines or so forth, where you're actually trying to effectively recreate the problem and have predictive capabilities by reproducing every component of the system, effectively you will never get anywhere. Is that okay? So we need to understand combustion in such a way that we simplify things in a manner such that we can reproduce the objectives of what we want to do, in a manner such that is consistent with the error bars that we have in regards to egress and life safety and, and property protection. Okay? But we have to be conscious that trying to model brute force combustion in the case of fire eventually is going to bring us to a dead end. It's too complex of a problem, it's too uncertain of a problem, and there is no need for such levels of precision if what you're comparing it is with things that have massive error bars. Okay? So it's about intelligent distillation of what matters, you know, what this problem is. Okay? So how do we actually get rid of combustion? Okay? It's by understanding how combustion works within the context of fire problems, and this is what we call fire dynamics. Okay? So fire dynamics is effectively the study of the combustion part of fire safety, and, uh, and it's our, our attempts to try to understand how to reproduce the phenomena without entering into all the details. The first thing that we need to be absolutely explicit about it, that it is all about time. Okay? So when we're talking about fire safety, time is of essence, and therefore time is something that we really need to pay an enormous amount of attention. We are going to modulate the evolution of the fire as a function of time. So we postulated our fire safety, safety strategy with very simple objectives, which is that the tenability conditions will not be attained until you have taken everybody out of the building and there has to be a very significant safety margin and that's what we call the RSET versus the ACET analysis, the required safe egress time against the available safe egress time. And we said that generally we would like structures to withstand a fire for as long as is necessary to get people out, but also generally we would not like buildings to collapse because of fires. Okay? So that's the aims of our fire safety strategy. And we went in great detail in looking into what the required safe egress time is, and, uh, and we tried to analyze uh, the, the, the problem to give you a sense of what kind of calculations you will have to do and what will be more or less the magnitude of your error bars. Okay? So that is done, and I'm not going to dwell on this anymore. You now have a sense, more or less, what you're fighting against. So where do we go from here? That's the real question. And, uh, and we're going to be looking into how do we establish the available safe egress time. Okay? In other words, how do we introduce combustion concepts to try to find that time that starts compromising people you know, within buildings. So the first thing that needs to be clarified is what is the difference from the perspective of safety when it comes you know, to a fire and an explosion. Okay? And, uh, and this is a very important difference because many times people equate fire safety with explosion safety. And there are two fundamentally different problems that require completely different skills 
and that require completely different processes. Okay, so let's talk about it. So what is the difference between dealing from a safety perspective, you know, with a fire as opposed to an explosion? Time. Yes, so where are we in the spectra of time when it comes to an explosion? Zero, is that okay? Well, in the case of a fire, what do we have? We have a period of time in which we have the capacity to influence the event. Is that okay? So once a premixture ignites and it starts spreading, can you actually influence how it's going to propagate? Not really. No? So you cannot do anything. So it's very similar in that sense to earthquakes, to floods, or to winds. Okay? So then how do we deal with, with an explosion? Prevention. It's purely prevention, no? So if you go to a plant like this, this is a, a Texas City, uh, an explosion happened in Texas City that, that uh, had a number of casualties, destroyed a very significant part of it, and it happened because there was one of the reactors that actually overpressured, and you had a spray of hot combustible liquids getting into the air, and the temperature was so high that they it evaporated very rapidly and it produced a cloud, and a vapor cloud, and effectively that ignited, and then you got a massive explosion that destroyed uh, half of the plant, okay? So prevention is the issue, no? So when you're dealing with explosions, effectively all you're trying to do is avoiding the explosion to happen, no? Is that okay? So how do you handle that process of prevention. What, what are the kinds of things that you're going to put in place to try to avoid an explosion from happening? Yeah, so for example, you're going to control ignition sources. So it's very common that in places where there are explosion hazards, what you're going to have is every electrical component is going to be grounded. You know, you're going to have special lights, special sockets, special everything. So there is no potential for any form of open electrical discharge. Is that okay? So you're going to eliminate all the ignition sources or minimize the existence of ignition sources. What else are you going to do? So, so you're going to do, have a very, very, very rigorous process of testing and maintenance to try to avoid this kind of things happening. No? So you have to really implement a series of procedures that are extremely, extremely rigid. You know, you're also going to design the processes in a way such that they have multiple redundancies, you know, that they are effectively very well controlled, and you're going to have a lot of data coming to you so that you can actually assess what the conditions, you know, of the plant are. So this one was really interesting because when they finally came to the essence of why this explosion happened, the drift of the data actually happened about two weeks before the event. So effectively one of the reactors was very, very slowly drifting and it was almost imperceptible, you know, what was going on. And the system had mechanisms of compensation that effectively, let's say, if the pressure goes a little bit higher, they will open this thing to try to lower the pressure. So they had mechanisms of compensation that hid that drift for a very, very long period of time. By the time the explosion happened, that level of compensation had been so high that you had drifted enormously from the normal operating conditions, but nobody was capable of seeing it. Okay? So, but all this information is part of the prevention process. So you design the process correctly, you maintain your systems correctly, you have an enormous amount of feedback data that constantly is telling you what the state of the system is. You know, and effectively you monitor all this in a way such that you prevent the explosion from happening. Is that okay? Now, for example, when it comes to uh, structural components, how would you address explosion building interaction. Yep. Uh, we try to create a system such that has redundancy of losing members and still maintain the capacity to uh, carry the load. Yeah, so basically you're going to do two things. You know, explosions tend to be fairly localized. So what you're going to create is systems that can redistribute loads in a very redundant way. 
Okay, so you can you do an elimination analysis. In other words, you can take a column, you can take a beam, you can take a wall, and the system still remains in place. So they're heavily redundant. So that is a way in which you structurally design the systems so that they can cope with the interaction. And then you design the system in a way that it can cope with the load. Okay, so what will be the load in the case of an explosion? Exactly. So basically you have a pressure wave. So that pressure wave is going to apply a pressure on the structural system and the structural system has to respond. In some cases it is just for robustness. In other cases it's actually to control the event. So for example in coal mines you design seals. Okay, and those seals have to be capable of withstanding a certain load. So we have testing equipment. Generally they're chambers in which you put a premixture in there, you ignite it, and you measure the evolution of the pressure as a function of time. Okay? With that evolution of the pressure as a function of time, then you use that as your input parameter for your design of the structural systems. Okay? So today we have what we call as a generic term, protective structures. So protective structures are structures that are meant to withstand a blast okay? or an explosion. There's other structures that are meant to fundamentally not follow progressive collapse, in other words, not fall apart, you know, and, and those are designed mostly on the basis of redundancies. So you're creating redundant systems, so you get distribution of loads. Now, interestingly enough, uh, explosion design of structures is quite particular because it's not only the maximum pressure that you're worried about. The maximum pressure gives you your static load, but you're actually very much worried about your dynamic load because effectively the DPDT, in other words, how fast the load comes in, can have even a much greater impact on the structure than a static load could potentially have. So if you think about it, it's pretty straightforward. I can put my finger and apply a lot of pressure and effectively my hand is holding it and it's completely different to me doing this. Okay, so the dynamic load has potentially a much worse uh, impact on the structure and it has to be designed in a completely different way than a static load that is applied into the structure. So when we did do our chamber tests, we effectively create a chamber, we put the premix gases, you know, we ignite them and then effectively what we do is we measure the pressure as a function of time, we take the peak as a criteria and we take the maximum DPDT. And those are the two variables that we're going to give structural engineers to design the structure. Okay? So as you can see, it's all preventive. You know, we've put all these things in place, and in a way, we are prepared for the explosion. We can try to avoid it in as much as we can, but nevertheless, we are going to be prepared to deal with the loads that are being created by the explosion. And there is absolutely no proactive, time-dependent activities that I'm going to put in place. Now, in some places, people argue that you should, for example, put mitigation strategies like putting water mists or sprinklers to minimize the impact of the explosions. The reality is that they're generally not that effective because obviously the activation of any of those systems is going to be so slow that by the time the pressure wave passes then effectively these things are going to activate behind. Okay? Now they might be useful in trying to prevent a fire following an explosion, but they're not necessarily there to mitigate the explosion. Other elements of mitigation are vents. So if you have enclosures, and this happens many in industrial spaces, you have an enclosure, and that enclosure, because it is an enclosure, it will build the pressure to a higher level because you cannot vent. So what you put in that, in that enclosure will be weak links. So certain places where effectively you create vents, that are going to break before the walls break so you can release the pressure through those vents. Again, you know, they have some level of effectiveness, but you actually do not, you can have a very high pressure without the confinement. Okay. Effectively, in the case of an explosion, if the, if the flame is moving fast enough, it is going to create a pressure wave ahead of it. And therefore, that is the pressure wave you're dealing with, and that could be already more than enough to create an enormous amount of damage. So vents can have a positive impact, but again, very secondary or minor elements you know, of the prevention strategy. Is that okay? 
So that's it. Now, when it comes to fire, obviously there is completely different, and then we have to deal with time. So the explosion is a non-premix flame. The fire, sorry, the fire is a non-premix flame. The explosion is a premix flame, and uh, we will not be addressing explosions because there is, you know, it it it, it is it is really from the perspective of safety, it's a much easier problem and it's much more conventional in nature. Okay. Uh, the strategy for explosions is basically prevention because your time tends to zero. And, uh, and this is an example of um, a situation where you have this combination of fire and explosions that will give you a very good sense of the difference. Today, nothing is working. But anyway, there's no need. So, you basically have a fire in there. Firefighters are fighting the fire. So, what happened there? So, this has been in the movies, so everybody knows what the name is. It's a backdraft. Okay? So, what is exactly a backdraft? Yeah, don't go to the end. Let's start from the beginning. No, no, one step before that. Yeah. You have an enclosure where you do not have enough. It's a very few risks. Okay, so that's 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 the initial part, no? Yeah. So effectively, what you have there is a compartment, and that compartment uh, has very limited openings. Okay, and you have a fire that is happening in here. Okay, so the very little air can get into that space. So what is effectively what is happening in the compartment because very little air is getting in. And you can tell because as you can see at the beginning, very little smoke is coming out from any of the openings. No, So firefighters seem to be throwing water at something. Okay, And uh, so let me, let me put it a little bit ahead again. So if you look at this stage, there's some smoke coming out, but it's actually not that much. So what do you think the firefighters, why are the firefighters throwing water at the top? Yeah. Trying to pull down the old layer, I guess. From above the roof? I don't know what to do. Why would they be doing that? Do you all agree? I couldn't hear what you said. Huh? I couldn't hear what you said. You can repeat it, please? Mine. Yeah. I mean, there, there is some reason why they are above you know, the building, and they are trying to control the fire from the roof. Exactly. That's exactly what is happening. So that's exactly what is happening. So effectively, there are no openings in the compartment, nowhere in there, okay? And somehow, 
they might have made the hole, but effectively what you have is some opening in here. Okay, and they're throwing water through the opening to try to get the water into the compartment. Now, if you think into the system, and it's effectively pretty much an enclosure, okay, and you have a little bit of smoke that is coming out in here, there's very little place for air to actually come inside, no? So effectively, as this is burning, okay, what happens is that you start creating uh, pretty much a situation by which you have consumed all the oxygen, and what you get is an equivalence ratio that effectively goes to infinity. Is that okay? It's pretty much fuel. Is that okay? So there's no oxygen in there left. So flames are lingering in there, okay? And uh, they pretty much consumed all the oxygen. And the firefighters are trying to throw a little bit of water in here, okay? So then look at what happens next. Okay, so what happened next? You put it again. So what happened? The window breaks, no? So window breaks, all of a sudden, you've opened this in here. Is that okay? So smoke, pours out, okay, and air, a fresh current of air is being entrained by the buoyant flow that is coming out. Is that okay? As air enters, what you start creating is somewhere around here, you start creating a premixture that actually has an equivalence ratio that is within the flammability limits. Is that okay? So, if you look at exactly what happens next, as soon as this comes out. Let me take one. Yep. So where does it ignite? Why, did this ha why does that happen? Why does it ignite at the top? Yeah. Yeah. So that basically is what tells me that effectively there was a hole in the roof. Okay. So the moment that I open the window and I create this buoyant plume, I'm going to entrain air through here, but I'm also going to entrain air through the hole. Okay. So the the actual equivalence ratio where it becomes within the combustible limits is probably somewhere around here. Okay? You probably have a hot spot somewhere in there because the flames have been heating the structure. Okay? And eventually this will be you know, your ignition point. Okay? Now once you have your ignition point, then now you have a premixture. Oops. So you have a premixture and then boom, the whole thing goes. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, potentially, yeah. So if the water evaporates and there's not enough openings to release the pressure, you might get a slight pressure buildup, you know, in there, which prevents air from coming in even further. So, so effectively all that is, is possible, but as you can see, what you get in there is a situation where you have transitioned, you know, from a diffusion flame into a premix flame, yes. Yeah, yeah, it will be thermal damage, so eventually the glass will get to a certain temperature where thermal expansion and the restraint by the frame will be sufficient to crack it, okay? And then the, the glass cracks. Now, Glass breakage is a very stochastic process because it is a combination of the restraint that is put by the frame 
you know, and the fact that the glass is a very brittle you know, material, but that actually thermally expands. So you start building up stresses and eventually it breaks. Okay? And we never really know exactly when it's going to break, but we do know that at some point it will most likely break. Okay? So, so it's purely a thermal problem. Okay? So as you can see, there is one very peculiar difference between a fire and an explosion, is that the flame in an explosion is going to move. Okay? So you have a propagating flame that effectively as it moves, it creates that pressure wave. While in the case of a fire, the fire is stationary. So a fire cannot move because it cannot move away from the burning fuel. That's where the fuel supply is. So the fuel supply is where the fire is, and the fire might fluctuate around it, but it will never move away other than just spreading and becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Is that okay? So when we're talking about fires, basically what you have is a diffusion flame, and that diffusion flame uh, is going to get the air, is going to produce heat feedback, and that heat feedback is going to evaporate the fuel, and then the chemical reaction happens, the combustion reaction, and then you produce products. It's a turbulent, generally turbulent flames that are dominated by buoyancy, so they are normally natural convection problems. Okay? Now, particularly when you have things burning in the surface, and this is a very interesting point about fires, you get a very unstable flow. So you get from rally taylor instabilities, all different types of instabilities forming, and flames tend to pulsate. So they don't really stay within the same place. You know, what they tend to do is to pulsate. Now, why does that happen? So why do you get these pulsations? Why are they unstable? Yes, but what is the characteristic of a jet? So, so those that are going up, but yep. at some point it's the higher density fuel that is going up. Okay. So there is going to be a problem that you're going to have a low density flow moving up, and the low density flow is uh, going to interact in different ways with a high density flow. On the sides is going to result in entrainment. At the top is probably going to result in displacement. And as the plume is losing strength, that displacement becomes weaker and weaker and weaker until eventually you stratify. Okay? Now, but let's think about the flame itself. I ask a question. The flame is going to pulsate. Why does that happen? Hmm? Yeah, but what it, what, why does the mixture lead to pulsations? But why didn't it just go up? Why, why, does, why does a flame of this nature do this? Yes. Why? Why can't it just reach an, equi an equilibrium? Yeah, but, but eventually it will re if the flame is laminar, okay, the flame will not pulsate. I mean, obviously turbulence plays a role into this, but why does it pulsate? boundary layer with a point of inflection in it with the rising plume, then that's inherently unstable for a wide river. Yes, it, I mean, it is unstable, we agree, okay? And it is related to a Raleigh-Taylor instability of some form, okay? So, so there is a, all these things are there, but I, I'm trying to understand what the source of all this, and this is extremely important because it defines the way in which we model fire problems. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not completely 
sure about it, but, but when you have uh, a sufficient amount of air and thereby oxygen, uh, you have a higher heat release rate, and that means you have a higher release of fumes when you have a higher heat release rate, but, but thereby afterwards with a higher amount of fuel, you have a, a more fuel rich mixture, mm. and thereby uh, suddenly you do not have enough oxygen. Okay, let me try to translate what you try to explain, yeah, yeah, okay? And, but but, but you, are, you are more or less where it's supposed to be. So yeah. let's, let's think of a problem that is much simpler than that, okay? So here we have fuel that is being produced, okay? We understand that the fuel is a result of a heat feedback. Is that okay? Heat comes in, it produces fuel, and that fuel feeds the flame. Is that okay? So. In principle, the feed, if I make the flame like this, perfectly horizontal, okay? Oxygen is gonna be here because here's where you have the air. Is that okay? Are we all comfortable with that? Okay? So let's say that I'm going to enrich this air and increase the amount of oxygen. So O2, goes up. There's no flow here, okay? What is going to happen with the flame? If I increase the amount of oxygen, the flame, where is the, what is the flame going to do? Huh? Okay, where does it go, down? So it goes down, no? Why does it go down? Mm, sort of. Let's talk a bit more technical and less hand wavy. But you're right. Yes. There is enough oxygen for the full combustion to occur. In there is enough air oxygen air. for combustion to occur everywhere. Okay. Yeah. So we're not talking about V-shaded environment. You have oxygen on top, fuel in the bottom, flame somewhere in there. When I increase the oxygen concentration, you told me the flame goes down, and I want to know why. Yeah, but why is it going down? I know I changed the boundary condition, and it is a diffusion flame. So the two of them are coming together. Yes? Okay, one of the things that is really interesting about diffusion flames is that diffusion flames really do not have flammability limits. Okay, in premixed flames, we have flammability limits because you have to propagate through the mixture. In diffusion flames, you are creating the mixture. So effectively, the flame will exist because you're creating a mixture that is within the flammability limits. Is that okay? So we are in the flammability limits, yeah. Okay, since the flame surface occurs at the point where fuel and oxygen are still geometric. Okay, there you go. So that's the first point. So where does the flame is when the equivalence ratio approximates one? Okay, so that is obviously not correct in the sense that it's never really one, but it, the highest probability of having sufficient collisions so that you get a chemical reaction is when you have the ideal mixture of fuel and oxidizer. Is that okay? So you're going to be transporting oxidizer in this direction. You're gonna be putting fuel in this direction and they will meet and produce a flame when you start approximating an equivalence ratio of one. Is that okay? So if I increase the oxygen concentration and the flame was originally here, now is this point going to be lean or rich? It's going to become lean, no? Okay, because you've increased the amount of oxygen with the same amount of fuel. Is that okay? So therefore, it's not in the right place. The flame has to approach the fuel to an area of higher richness to compensate for the amount of oxygen that I just added. Is that okay? So you get a displacement of the flame in this direction. This is the principle behind the Berg-Schumann analysis. So the Berg-Schumann analysis defines the flame where you get stoichiometric mixture, and that allows you to put the flame in a certain place. Is that clear? So, but the moment that I bring the flame to this position, then I have increased my heat feedback. 
Is that okay? So the moment that I increase the heat feedback, that basically means my fuel goes up. Is that okay? So if my fuel goes up, now the flame was here, and I've increased the amount of fuel, so what happens with the stoichiometry? It becomes rich. So where does the flame have to go? Up. Now what happens when the flame then now starts going up? It reduces the heat, and you reduce the fuel, and then what happens? It goes down. There you go. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Okay? But what did I have to do to get that started? I had to change something. But once it gets started, it's an instability, and it will never stop. Is that okay? Because it will never really converge to zero. It just simply starts oscillating around a certain point. Now, how do I get it started in a pool fire? So if I have a fuel that is burning and the flame is here, okay, the problem starts here, the fact that it's finite. Okay? So what you get is that you get air coming in here, fuel being produced in here, okay, and the strength of the pump is given by the angle that the density gradient okay, has with respect to gravity. Is that okay? So the term in Navier-Stokes that controls the problem is a term that is rho g. Okay? And these are vectors in the sense that the density changes with location. Okay? And gravity changes with location. Okay? So effectively what you have is that there is an angle between the d rho dx, if you want to call it, okay? and gravity. That angle creates a buoyant flow. Is that okay? Now let's look at this problem. So if gravity is like this, okay? we know gravity goes in that direction. Now, the density okay, is high density here, low density here. In other words, the gradient is parallel. This is the density gradient. Will there be any buoyant flows? Yes, because the low density is below, and it will be lost here. Only if the problem is finite, no? Is that okay? So if, the, if it's an infinitely f flat surface, it will be an unstable condition, okay? But it will not create any flows because it's unstable, but the two vectors are parallel. So the cross product is equal to zero, you have no baroclinicity, and effectively there's no motion. If I shift it, and now I make this low density and this high density, Okay. Then again, I have the same problem. If everything is infinite, there will be no motion. Is that okay? Now, what happens now if your gravity goes there, but your density gradient goes in this direction? So now you have high density, low density. Then it starts moving, no? Because effectively now, the angle between the, den the gravity vector okay, and the density vector is 90 degrees. The cross product is maximum. Okay, and what happens? You have the biggest strength to the flow. So effectively, the low density is going to go down. The high density is going to go up. Is that okay? So buoyancy takes the role. Are we happy with that? So bigger angle stronger, smaller angle, weaker. Everybody happy with that? Yep. Zero angle, nothing happens. 90 degrees, maximum value. Now, if you're here, you have an angle, okay? And the angle is the density gradient is perpendicular to this. 
This is gravity. This is my angle. Is that okay? So an entrainment flow is going to happen. Are we happy with that? What happens? So the moment an entrainment flow is going to happen, air is pushing itself in. So this point that used to be stoichiometric, if I push more air, what is going to happen? Becomes lean. So the flame starts going down. And the moment the flame starts going down, what happens with the angle? It starts going to zero. So the airflow becomes weaker. Okay? So you reduce your oxygen concentration and your flame goes back up. So effectively, the two of them start doing this. Once it gets started, it's gone forever. Okay? It will continue to pulsate endlessly. Okay? Now, obviously, you have to give this a little bit of a thought. Okay? But effectively, it's all about the angle between gravity and density. Okay? And that creates this pulsation. And the pulsation, once it gets started, it never goes away. Okay? Now, the moment the flame starts pulsating, it alters the entrainment. Because when it's strong, it pushes very high, and you get the, the push down, and it produces a vortex. Okay? Now, when it's weak, that vortex is warm, so the vortex propagates up. So you start shedding vortices. Every time it becomes strong, a vortex gets produced, and then when it becomes weak, the vortex gets shed. Is that okay? So that dominates the whole process of entrainment. It's that fluctuation that will determine how you are entraining air into the system. Is that okay? Now, why do I pay so much attention to this? Because effectively you have a flame that is in a place and is oscillating around the place. That is creating a flow structure that is determining how much air is coming overall to the flame. And we know that the air plus the fuel effectively is what gives me the products. So I'm going to get air that is being entrained, feedback that is going to come back, oops, fuel yeah. that is being produced, and products that comes out. So the smoke or the products that are going to come out are going to be the summation of the mass of air plus the mass of fuel. That's conservation of mass, no? So if I want to know how much smoke I have, I have to know how much air I'm entraining. Is that okay? So any attempt to understand the production of smoke requires you to be able to quantify the air entrainment. And because the air entrainment is a system that is fluctuating in time, and that system that is fluctuating in time is creating these vortical structures that entrain more air into the system, effectively, if you don't reproduce that, you will never be able to understand how much smoke is being produced. Okay? So what are the two most utilized conventional techniques for numerical modeling? Large steady simulation is one. The direct numerical simulation we said for fire, it will never work, it's too small. Is there another one? Rams, Reynolds, Avers, Navier, Stokes. Okay? So there's two types of numerical simulations that we use. One is Reynolds, Avers, Navier, Stokes, Rams, and the other one is large eddy simulation. So what is the fundamental difference between those two techniques? Mm -hmm. without getting deep, too deeply into the nature of the turbulence. Okay, and what about large area simulation then? You don't really solve for the smaller areas, no, which means that you uh, solve for the energy. The energy 
it's always like using the bullet edits where you, you just create a sub model to account for that and then you're green, you only solve for the other you didn't see when you try to do your edits. Okay, so in large edit simulation, what you're track, trying to track is the energy associated to the large eddies. That's where it comes large eddy simulation. So the smaller fluctuations are irrelevant. I'm going to create a subgrid model for the smaller fluctuations, and I'm going to focus on the large eddies. Is that okay? So if I get a system that effectively has a vortex that looks like this, what I'm going to say is this is what dominates the problem. And I know that for fire that's the case. That's what creates the entrainment, those vortices that are being shed. So a large eddy simulation will get a large cell of dimension, the eddy. Is that okay? Well, in the case of rams, I'm going to do something completely different. Okay, which is I'm going to describe turbulence in a very simple way. And the way in which I'm going to describe turbulence is by basically saying that the turbulent viscosity is going to be an average viscosity plus an, av an average fluctuation. Okay? So in other words, what I'm going to do is take the problem in time, find the average viscosity, and then take all the little fluctuations around that average viscosity and find you know, the dimension of this prime. Is that okay? That's the way I do it in large area simulation, sorry, in, in runs. So effectively in runs, I'm going to average over time. Is that okay? So the flame in runs will never look like this. The flame in runs will look like a triangle. Okay? Because I've averaged over time and I've disappeared all the fluctuations. Is that okay? Well, in large eddy simulation, what I'm doing is I'm disappearing what is happening inside, okay? And basically model the kinetic energy inside that cell and then track the motion of that cell as a function of time. In other words, what I'm going to be doing is taking time and seeing how that cell moves up and down, up and down in time. Okay? But what happens inside the cell, I make it an average. Okay? So this is really fundamental because immediately it tells you that if I want to reproduce a problem like this, where entrainment is what really matters, okay, I cannot do runs because runs will never be able to calculate the kinetic energy that effectively determines how much air is going to get into the flame. So it is inevitable that fire problems have to be modeled with large eddy simulation. Is that okay? Because the fluid mechanics if you do it in any time average fashion, will always result in a problem that is not capable of properly predicting the air entrainment. Is that clear? So nowadays, everybody talks in fire about the fire dynamic simulator, and everybody talks about large eddy simulation, and everybody talks about these things, and everybody works with large eddy simulations. 20 years ago, everybody used to do RANS. Okay, the original computer codes that were developed for fires were all Reynolds average Navier Stokes. Why did we do that? Because effectively, we didn't have the computational power to be able to resolve the Navier Stokes equations as a function of time, even if the grid cell was large. Is that okay? So now we're capable of using large eddy simulations and have a grid cell that is sufficiently small to be able to address the kinetic energy in an appropriate way. Is that okay? Are we happy with that? Yeah? So, if I average in time, effectively, computationally, this is a lot less expensive because I only solved the problem once. Is that okay? Well, if I increase 
the cell, but I still allow time to go. I have to solve the problem every step of time. So computationally, it's much more expensive. And therefore, if I want to have equal computational cost, I will have a cell of 10 centimeters here. And for equal computational cost, I might actually be able to do this in a millimeter cell. Okay. So the problem with LES today is that effectively, I cannot shrink the cell enough to be able to reproduce certain physical problems associated to fire. So let's talk about those. We are going to deal with LES. We have no choice because we need the time component. Is that OK? But now, because the computational cost is very high, I have to make my cell big, the size of the large eddy. OK? Now, the problem with LES is that actually you cannot shrink the cell too much. Because if you shrink the cell too much and you move away from the large eddy, then the concept that I can average inside this large eddy starts breaking down. So grid independence in a large eddy simulation problem is actually not possible. Because as you shrink the cell, the model doesn't work anymore. This is where you migrate into direct numerical simulation, where you're not making any assumptions of what is happening inside, but you're shrinking the cell to the point where you can actually reproduce turbulence in a correct and direct way. Is that OK? We cannot do that. Yeah. So the issue right now, the numerical simulation is like LES 20 years ago. It's something that we know. We don't have the capacity to. Computationally. Yeah. Yes, so we cannot do numerical, direct numerical simulation in fire because we don't have the computational power. Now, the problem is that the transition between RANS and LES is, let's say, the transition of 1 to 10 in computational power. Well, the transition from LES under the scales of fire to direct numerical simulation is 1 in 10,000. So, so the increase in computational power has to be enormous before we can actually start solving these problems using direct numerical simulation. Okay? Now, let's try to understand then what are, what are the problems. Okay? We've decided already it has to be time dependent. Okay? Let's forget about direct numerical simulation. Let's focus on LES, which is what we can do today. So what are the fundamental problems with trying to apply large eddy simulation to a fire problem? Okay. That will depend on the combustion, which happens at a smaller scale. Okay, so effectively you have a cell. Okay? And you are trying to get your heat feedback. Okay? And your heat feedback requires you being able to resolve what is happening in this cell. Is that okay? So the size of this cell associated to the large eddy. Is that okay? So we're talking about centimeter in size. Are we happy with that? Okay. So what is the flame thickness? What is the typical, give me one estimate of what do you think the thickness of a diffusion flame is? I'm going to send you to Sebastian Candel's class. <laughs> no, seriously, what do you think? Two millimeters? You, I'm, I'm kind of confused. You mean those wrinkles? Or the no, no, I'm talking about the flame thickness, the flame sheet. Yeah, so that's called the flame sheet approximation. So you assume that the thickness is zero. Okay. So I'm going to say very, very 
<laughs> I mean, definitely not two millimeters. Two millimeters is very thick. I mean, a paper is thicker than, the, than a flame. Keep in mind you're talking about the peak reaction point. So, you know, obviously you're going to have, in, in some cases, you're going to have potentially multiple chemical reactions happening. But even then, I mean, they're going to happen in a very, very, very narrow area. So, you know, we're talking about easily a tenth of a millimeter, one hundredth of a millimeter. You're talking about microns. Okay, that's a typical flame thickness. So, if you talk to any person that does premix flames and you ask them, give me a number for the flame thickness, it will come out like that. You know, that's what people that do premix flames do. So, effectively, they will tell you instantaneously it's going to be of the order of 10 microns. Okay? It's time. People that talk about fire or talk about diffusion flames will have absolutely no clue because it's irrelevant. Because the flame doesn't propagate. And therefore, because the flame doesn't propagate, who cares what the thickness of the flame is? You're not doing the heat transfer problem that people that do premix flames are doing, where you have a flame front that is moving, heating up the reactants. Okay? We have a flame, it's there. You know, and nobody really cares what it looks like. Is that okay? But it's very, very thin. Not only is it very thin, but it's going to be wrinkled. Okay? So the problem with LES is effectively that the way in which we define diffusion flames is we say the flame is where fuel and oxidizer reach in stoichiometric proportions. Is that okay? So number one, within a single cell, that is going to happen in a million different places. So we first need to find a way to average the way in which fuel and oxidizer are getting together so that I can establish okay, some form of spatial average that allows me to say in this cell there will be a flame. I'm not resolving the small eddies. All I'm saying is in this cell there will be a flame. In this cell here there will be fuel. In this cell here there will be oxidizer. Okay? So I am not constructing the flame correctly as I would have done using Burke Schumann. What I'm creating is an artificial way of saying there will be flame here, there is none here, there is flame here. So if you think of FDS, what does FDS do to establish there is a flame? The fire dynamic simulator. Who is familiar with FDS? Oh. No, who knows of the existence of FDS? That's a better question. So the fire dynamic simulator, for those who don't know, is the most common tool that fire people use to do numerical simulation. And the one plot that I showed yesterday is based on FDS. Okay? So it's a very common numerical tool. It operates on the principle of large eddy simulation. It was the first fire computer model that introduced large eddy simulation. It took over the entire market because it was the first one who could actually predict entrainment. Is that okay? So they did that part. But then all of a sudden, you start looking into the problem in more in detail. Now, there's a couple of other codes now. The second most popular is called Fire Foam and is based on Open Foam platform and, uh, and effectively does the same thing. Okay? Just slightly, slight nuances here and there. Okay? But effectively, they're all large eddy simulation codes and they all have this particularity that they operate with fairly large cell sizes. Okay? So the way in which they establish that a flame is there is by doing transport 
and saying that effectively this cell on average is stoichiometric. Is that okay? So they extrapolate this concept that is designed for a zero dimensional flame sheet approximation, they extrapolate it to basically an average of the cell. Okay? So what you're doing is basically saying that in this cell you will get a supply of fuel and a supply of oxygen that is on average stoichiometric. Is that okay? That's the mixture fraction model that they have. They don't solve the fuel equation. They don't solve the oxidizer equation. What they do is the same thing that Berg Schumann does. They convert the two of them into the schwab seldovich variable. They normalize the variable, and then they come up with a mixture fraction. Okay? That, that system effectively delivers the position where fuel and oxidizer are arriving stoichiometric. Is that okay? So basically, the flame here is on average. Then what I'm going to do is, because I know I have fuel and oxidizer arriving on average, and here is where a flame is going to be, what I'm going to do then is take all the fuel and all the oxidizer, make it combust, and I release all the energy here. I don't release it here. I don't release it here. I release the energy cell. Is that okay? So if you do that, then your temperature, would it be the flame temperature? No. What is it going to be? Yes, because it's going to be an average between the flame temperature and some lots of colder areas, no? So your temperature is going to be inevitably smaller than the flame temperature. Is that okay? Are we happy with that? What about your soot concentration? Would it even be an average? So, okay, how do I establish how much soot do I have? It's not very concrete. You already said mass of air plus mass of fuel, right? Yeah. So they would uh, see how much mass of air to mass of fuel there is in that region and get soot production from that. Well, that's what the model will do, but is that what reality does? So how does soot get produced in a combustion reaction? When it's not complete. Well, when it's, when it's not complete. But the question is where, how, where, how do I establish this? Keep in mind that I'm making the assumption that fuel and oxidizer are being delivered in stoichiometric conditions. Okay? I can even claim that I have an infinitely fast reaction because it's burning. I'm assuming it's going to burn. You know, when, when you do Berg Schumann, effectively what you do is you eliminate the chemistry because you assume infinite chemistry. How do you create soot? It's produced on the, produced on the fuel side, no? Yes. Now, why is a flame yellow? And why is the soot radiating? And yeah, but if it's cold, it will not, you won't see it, no? So why, why is it radiating? OK. So what happens when the soot reaches the flame front? It oxidizes, no? Remember when I was talking about the closed tip flame below the smoke point? Is there any soot being produced? No, because it's all oxidized. Is that okay? Now, if I quench the flame and the flame opens, then you get soot that is coming out because it's not oxidized. Is that okay? So that soot that is not oxidized is actually black because it's cold and it's going away. 
Okay? The soot that is radiating is the one that is being oxidized because it's getting very close to the flame. It gets hot and eventually it gets oxidized. Are we happy with that? So you, are, you start from the fuel, you start breaking down the fuel, you produce soot, and then the soot gets close to the flame. Part of it gets oxidized, part of it gets transport, transported. But the oxidation, that soot that is being oxidized is the one that is being heated to the flame temperature, and that's the one that is radiating. Is that okay? But to be able to know how much of that soot I have, I have to be able to resolve the chemistry of the process that brings me from the fuel all the way to the flame. So if I have a flame that looks like this, I start with my fuel, okay? Then I come tomorrow morning, sit in Henry Curran's class, and I ask Henry, how do I model the whole chemistry until I get to this point? This will give me the soot concentration at this point, okay? I know what the flame temperature is, and with these two terms, I will create radiation. Is that okay? Are we happy with that? It's very complicated, yeah. no? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have a, a nice little laminar diffusion flame, you can potentially model this. But now, we're here. Can I introduce in a large eddy simulation of a cell that is of the centimeter size, can I introduce soot production and soot oxidation chemistry? Yes, so all you can do is basically say, on average, there's an average soot concentration in there, okay? But that average, is it going to be higher or lower than the soot in this flame here? Lower. Inevitably lower, no, because here you don't have any soot. Okay, and this is the peak. So this average value is less than this, is that okay? So inevitably, your soot determines the emissivity of the flame. Is that okay? It's going to determine the soot concentration is one of the terms that defines the extinction coefficient and therefore defines an average emissivity for the flame. Is that okay? The more soot you have, the more your flame emits. Is that clear? So this number here, Emissivity, is that okay for the flame? Let's put, this is large eddy, okay? And this suit here is going to determine the real emissivity of the flame, is that okay? This temperature is an average temperature. So when you do epsilon, sigma, t to the fourth, and you put average and average, and you do epsilon, sigma, t to the fourth, and you put flame temperature and the real value, which one is going to be bigger? No? Actually, potentially, much, much bigger. Yes? Okay, you're confusing magnitudes with sensitivity, okay? Any error that I make at the temperature is going to have a huge impact on this. Any error that I make at the soot, okay, is going to have a lesser impact on this, that's sensitivity. But keep in mind that here, at least, I know what the energy is. I've just averaged it, okay? Here, I have no idea what the chemistry is. I just guessed it.
So, can you ever model radiation using large eddy simulation for a fire? No. Is that okay? You're going to have to approximate it in a very coarse manner. Is that okay? And then you tell me, but why don't you just shrink the cell? You don't have the computational power, no? So why can't I just simply solve for a little part of the flame? No, but why can't I just simply take, you know, instead of solving this whole problem, why can't I just take a little part of the flame here? The combustion people do it. I mean, they do it for engines. Well, that's the whole thing. When it's a premixed flame, yeah. I can make the assumption that my boundaries you know, are so, non, so homogeneous that I can take one little bit, solve it in great detail, you know, and then extrapolate it to the rest. Now, why can I not do that in fires? The moment that it's a diffusion flame, okay, the problem that you have is that your length scale is determined by the separation between where the fuel is and where the oxidizer is. Is that okay? So the moment that I have a room of this size and I put a fire in the middle, what happens? The fire starts burning, it creates a flow, the flow hits the walls, friction losses, friction losses, and that affects my entrainment. Changes my stoichiometry, I change the flame. Is that okay? Because the flame will move to a different place. I open a door, and then what happens? Air comes in, my flame moves around. So I have no capacity to get rid of the boundaries. I need to model the entire domain. Or if the flame is very small, and the room is enormous, all I need to do is model as far away as I believe he has no more impact on the flame. But the length scale is still the fire. So the diameter of the fire is an absolutely unavoidable length scale. And in most realistic fire problems, the size of the compartment becomes my unavoidable domain. Because it affects the way the air comes in. Is that okay? So I'm gonna have to wait until 2080, you know, before I actually can model this using the appropriate length scales. Right now, it is not that we don't have the tools. It is not that we don't know how to do it. It's just purely we can't, okay? The problem with fires is that at the end, radiative heat transfer is fundamental. You'll never be able to model flame spread appropriately without radiation, okay? You will never be able to model the temperature of the smoke without radiative losses. You will never be able to model heat transfer to a structure without the radiative losses. And unfortunately, all I can do is approximate radiative heat losses. Is that okay? That miracle that people think that if you run FDS, you hit enter, and it gives you these beautiful pictures, and then all of a sudden, everything is solved, is absolutely nonsense. Because fundamentally, the moment that you are four orders of magnitude bigger than the flame thickness, there is no way you can handle that problem correctly. Now, there's certain people that believe you can put a probability density function Okay, so when you do runs, that works because effectively there's a position for the mean. And I can say, well, let's distribute this like this with some sort of PDF, a probability density function, that basically tells me where the highest probability will be that the flame is. And I can distribute the energy in such a way that I put most of the energy in that position. You can do that when you make an average and you have standard deviations. Is that okay? The problem here 
is that you have no clue where the flame is. And the flame is in many places in this direction and is in many places in the other dimension and in the third dimension. So it's a wrinkle flame that is all over the place and there is no mechanism to create a probability density function. So the application of probability density functions to LES for fire, again, requires you to be able to shrink the cell to the point where you recognize that there's only one flame front. I can shrink it to the point where I know there will be a single frame front in here. You go back to the sub-millimeter scale. Is that okay? So what are the issues? Radiation is a huge problem associated to our incapacity to predict the temperature correctly and our incapacity to resolve the soot chemistry. These are the two black holes of fire chemistry. Okay? You cannot get these numbers right. Okay? Now, why numerically we can't? Because unfortunately, our domain is determined by the size of the compartment and the size of the fire. Those are the characteristic length scales of the problem, and they are unavoidable. Is that okay? So, because those are the characteristic length scales, computationally, I cannot reduce the cell beyond the centimeter scale. Is that okay? Which effectively lands me with hundreds of wrinkled flames inside and an incapability of coming up with a proper probabilistic distribution for the presence of the flame. Is that okay? So, once again, so I'm going to stop here and then I start moving. So, once again, we come up to the same conclusion. What is what we're trying to do? We have an untractable problem that we need to look at it in a completely imaginative way so that we effectively solve something that cannot be solved. Is that okay? Going back to the great Lafayette, in most places in the world, that's called magic. Okay? So we're going to try to put some magic into this problem in, you know, after the break. So let's take 10 minutes and then we'll start again. <laughs>